Well, this uh, series kind of has the feel of an upside-down infomercial, you know? And, and in light of that, in honor of that, we have some amazing products up here. I, I don't know if you've noticed. Here's the deal, though. We are going to give all these products away to one lucky winner. How could that be you, you're asking? Here's how. Uh, what we're going to do is the first four weeks of this series, every time you fill out a connection card, which were on your seats when you came in, uh, we will enter it into a drawing and we're going to pull one lucky winner who will win all the products. You could use that connection card if you're new to let us know you are here and uh, give us your contact info if you want. We'll send you some information in the mail about our church or if you're a regular here, you can just say hi or you can give us something to pray for and you could be the lucky winner who wins this. What could you win? Let's just look at a couple things. These, for instance, are pajama jeans. <laughs> Pajama jeans. Now, I, I gotta say, I understand the idea of wanting to wear your pajamas out. They're comfy. I don't understand the idea of wanting to wear jeans to bed, but somebody wanted them because they make pajama jeans. Uh, we also have, uh, right here, we have the Justin Bieber singing toothbrush. Yeah? So as you brush, you could hear, baby, baby, baby. Don't forget your back molars, molars, molars. I, I don't know. Yeah, so uh, there's more. We'll look at it in the next few weeks, but you could win if you fill out a connection card. So uh, this series we're starting today is called Five Easy Ways to Wreck Your Life. Over the next five weeks, we're going to teach you how to totally ruin your life. Are you excited for that? I'm not sure you should be excited for that, but okay. Uh, well, here's what I think will happen in this series. I think some of us are going to think and maybe say, um, man, I've already learned that the hard way. And, and there's going to be some other things where we're going to think, man, I've never thought about that, but it kind of opens my eyes and I'm going to avoid that now. And, and I think uh, there's also going to be things where we realize, wow, I made that mistake, but now I know how to recover from it and start living the life I've always wanted to live. I, I think probably all of us could say we've learned some things the hard way, right? Like, I mean, you only bite down on a fork sideways once, right? You only put ice on your back teeth once. You only believe the Cubs are going to win the World Series once. I didn't know Mike was making a Cubs joke in his song. We're kind of hitting the Cubs hard today. We've all learned some mistakes the hard way. And what we're going to do in this series is we're going to learn from someone else's mistakes uh, uh, mistakes another guy made by reading his journal. Anybody in here ever kept a journal or maybe a diary when you were young? No one? Okay, some of you, yeah. Um, has anyone ever read someone else? You ever peek in somebody else's diary? Anyone ever maybe get in trouble for looking in like your brother or sister's diary? I, I found some actual journal or diary entries from kids. Some parents went in and took pictures of their kids' diaries. These are kind of funny, so let me show you a few of them. Uh, this kid wrote, Today is September 21st, 2010. I farted in my mom's lap. It was hilarious. I, get, I like that kid. I want to hang out with him. Uh, next kid wrote, I love soup and I hate my sisters. I get that. I understand that. Uh, this kid wrote, my mom is so mean. She won't let me catch the ice cream man because I was being a meanie pants. Grrr. Makes sense. And last, hi, I'm Kelly and this is my story. Once it was spring, I was starting soccer, and one day I shot a girl in the face. <laughs> that escalated quickly. I'm hoping she meant shot a soccer ball in her face, but I don't know. I don't know. Well, here's what's interesting. You know, it, it's, it's fascinating and, and can be informative to read someone else's journal. And in the Bible, we actually have someone's journal. Uh, there's a book in the Bible called Ecclesiastes. Uh, the word Ecclesiastes means uh, the gatherer or the teacher. And Ecclesiastes is the journal of a man named King Solomon. Uh, Solomon lived several thousand years ago, but he was a, a powerful, wealthy, wise king. And, and in his journal, he, he shares some of the things that he learned in his life. Here's what I think you're going to find amazing if you come for the five weeks of this series. Despite the fact that this dude lived like thousands of years ago in a different part of the world, like it is so relevant to our lives and it will be so practical for our lives. I heard someone say once, they said, stupid is making the same mistake 
over and over again. Smart is learning from your mistakes. Geniuses learn from other people's mistakes. And what we're going to do in this series is we are going to become geniuses. Woo! So you guys were more excited when I said, we're going to wreck our lives. You're all like, yeah! And then I said, we're going to become geniuses. You're like, yeah, golf club for that one. I, I don't get that, but okay. Um, so uh, we're going to look at his life, and we're going to learn from the mistakes that he made. And uh, if you have a Bible with you, you can open to Ecclesiastes, which is kind of right in the middle of the Bible. Your Bible has a table of contents, so we'll show you where it is. If you don't have a Bible, uh, no problem. We're going to put all the verses on the screen for you. And if you don't own a Bible, we'd love to give you one for free today. There's two ways we can do that. One is there's a stack of Bibles uh, at the Velcro bar, which is our connecting place. And the other is we um, have a Bible embedded in the Verve app, which is free. You can download that on your phone. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to start at the end of the journal and then go back to the beginning. Now, if it was like a novel, we would not read the end first. It'd ruin the whole story. But it's not a novel. It's just the open, transparent writings of a guy at the end of his life. And, and so I think looking at the end is going to shed light on some of the things that he writes about the lessons that he learned along the way. All right. So uh, Ecclesiastes, last chapter, chapter 12, we're going to start with verse 13. And it says this. Solomon writes, now all has been heard. Here is the conclusion of the matter. Fear God and keep his commandments, for this is the duty of all mankind. By the way, when it says fear, it doesn't mean like you're shaking in fear. The, the idea of that word in the original language is more like a respect, a reverence for. And, and so Solomon's saying, listen, when you get to the end of your life, like I am, and, and all is said and done, you're going to realize that life was about God. Life is about doing life God's way, doing life with God, and so, know God. Know God's love. Love God. Listen to his wisdom and apply it to your life. Don't do what I did. Don't wreck your life. You live your life with God. And if you do, you will know real freedom and you will achieve your full potential. And Solomon's life ends with such truth, but also with a lot of regret. And it's interesting because his life began with such promise. Like maybe more than anyone I could ever think of or imagine. So Solomon was the second son of King David and his wife Bathsheba. And David hands the kingdom to Solomon. So Solomon is going to become king of one of the most powerful nations at the time in the world. And he then has this incredible moment with God. Like God has this interaction with him where God says, make any request you want and I'm going to grant it. Solomon's like, um, God, here's the deal. I'm young, and, and I now have to oversee this entire nation, and I, I don't think I'm up to the task. And so I want wisdom. If you're going to give me whatever I want, I want wisdom. Well, God was thrilled with Solomon's selfless request. And, and so God says, I'm going to give you what you asked for, and I'm going to give you what you didn't ask for. So God gives Solomon wisdom, but he also gives him uh, wealth and power and possessions. And God blesses him in all kinds of ways. And, and when Solomon was young, he really centered his life on God. Uh, during that time, he wrote another book of the Bible called Proverbs. It's this incredible book of just godly wisdom to live your life by. And, you know, it, it's one thing to, to have wisdom it's another thing to actually embrace it and apply it to your life. And, and what happens is Solomon starts out applying God's wisdom. And, and later, though, he starts to trust his own thinking instead of God's wisdom. And, and his life just starts to kind of fade away from God. And, and, and his life just starts getting wrecked. And, uh, and we're going to see that in his journal. So let's go back to the beginning now, uh, verses 1 and 2. This is the way how he starts his journal. He writes, the words of the teacher, son of David, king in Jerusalem, meaningless, meaningless, says the teacher, utterly meaningless. Everything is meaningless. Yay! It's really uplifting, right? Like, like if you're looking for a speaker for your corporate event, 
consider this guy, right? It's like, ladies and gentlemen, meaningless. Everything is meaningless. So what I want us to do is I want us to work hard. I want us to take this company from good to great and rise our profits. And in the end, we'll know that all we did was meaningless. It will all be completely, yeah, right? Or, or you could hire him to be like the entertainment for your kid's party, right? And, and so he's like, hey, kids, here's what's going to happen in your lives. Um, you, you're going to grow up, and you're going to go off to college, and you're going to get a job, and, and you're going to get married, and all of it is going to be meaningless, kids. It's mean, and then you'll die. Good luck with that. Right? Yay! Solomon turns out really like the word meaningless. In fact, 38 times in this little book of the Bible, he uses that word meaningless. He often uses this phrase, uh, chasing after the wind. He's like, it's like chasing after the wind. You can never catch it. It's, it's meaningless. And what he's saying is now that I'm at the end of my life and I look back, I can tell you that life apart from God when I started to drift away from God, life became meaningless. It, it was a chasing after the wind. It was futile. It, it was like life was this vapor that vanishes, and it all turned out to be meaningless. Life without God for me was meaningless. I, I think what Solomon was trying to say could be represented pretty well by this toy. Any of you have this when you were a kid, or maybe your kid had it when you were a parent? Yeah? Uh, kids, it's, so if you've never seen it, it's shapes, and there's these pieces inside, and the idea is that you have to put the right shaped piece into the right hole. It's the only way it will fit. Parents love for their kids to have these because it's how you learn shapes. It's also how kids learn to swear, it turns out, like... You let this thing snap you a couple times, kids learn to curse real fast. Um, interesting little tidbit. I don't, I don't know if you've been coming to Ver for a while, but there's a guy on our staff named Jacob Sanders. Maybe you've met him. Uh, he's from Kentucky, and it turns out that in Kentucky, instead of the ACT or SAT, this is the college entrance exam in Kentucky. Yeah, like, like they do. They just, you sit at a desk, they hand you one of these, they say, good luck. You only got three hours, and that's it. That's what you do. Turns out. So, so you know, th this is a toy, but, but I would guess that we all know the feeling of trying to fit something into an empty space inside of us and realizing that the thing we're trying to fit in there doesn't fit. And, and we still feel empty, right? I think we've all had this sense of emptiness in our life, and we've tried to grasp for things that, that we think are going to make us feel full, and we still feel empty. And, and that's exactly what Solomon did, and now he's at the end of his life, and he's trying to share from his mistakes, and he's warning us, don't do what I did. Like, just center your life on God. That's the only thing that's going to give everything else meaning. My life was so good and then I just let it slip away as I, as I fell away from God. Everything lost meaning, and, and I just had this emptiness, and I'm here about to die, and I've got all these regrets. So what were some of the things that Solomon tried to shove into this God-sized hole only to realize that they didn't fit and didn't fill his emptiness? But what are some of the mistakes he made that he's warning us not to make? Well, first... Pleasure. Pleasure. The, the, the first mistake that wrecked his life and that he's warning us to make is don't let pleasure guide you. Like if you want to wreck your life, here's how to do it. Just let your appetites channel you and, and set the direction for your life's pursuit. Like let thrill-seeking and, and, and stimulation drive your decisions. Eat, drink, party, spend your money, chase, you know, women, hook up with as many as you can. Let happiness be your God. Kind of like Sheryl Crow saying, if it makes you happy, it can't be that bad. Stuff all of that into your God-shaped hole and see what happens. You see what happens. Now, that's what Solomon did. Instead of seeking God, he saw it pleasure. Instead of seeking to please God, he sought to please himself. And what happened to him is what happens to everyone. In the end, 
pleasure became his God. And he realized it did not make him feel less empty. Well, let's check out what he writes about this. Uh, Ecclesiastes chapter 2, verse 1. I said to myself, come now, I will test you with pleasure to find out what is good. So he's on this, this pursuit of trying to figure out what is life all about, what's going to fill this emptiness inside of me. He says, I'm going to try pleasure. And, and so he decided to have as much fun to, to, to fill himself with as much pleasure as he could. So for instance, that decision led him to marry just about every halfway decent looking girl he ever met. Like this was a different time, remember, but check it, this out. So his story, his life story is told in the Bible in a book called First Kings. And in First Kings chapter 11, we learn about this, it says, King Solomon, however, loved many foreign women besides Pharaoh's daughter. Moabites, these are different nations, Ammonites, Edomites, Sidonians, Hittites. They were from nations about which the Lord had told the Israelites you must not intermarry with them because they will surely turn your hearts after their gods. Nevertheless, Solomon held fast to them in love. He had 700 wives of royal birth and 300 concubines, and his wives led him astray. By the way, that doesn't even mention the problems he had with his 1,000 mother-in-laws. I can't even imagine. And then it says, as Solomon grew old, his wives turned his heart after other gods. And his heart was not fully devoted to the Lord, his God, as the heart of David, his father, had been. So Solomon's pursuit of pleasure, he said, maybe it's, it's women, maybe it's sex, maybe it's having, you know, companionship. And so he, he marries all these women and, and, and he finds himself going further away from God, feeling even more empty. The void is getting bigger. And so look what he writes about that. So we'll, we'll go back to that verse and then continue. I said to myself, come now, I will test you with pleasure to find out what is good. But that also proved to be meaningless. Laughter, I said, is madness. And what does pleasure accomplish? And so he's saying, man, even pleasure, even laughter can still be empty. In fact, often it's just masking pain. I don't know if you've discovered this. I, I've noticed that a lot of times the, the people who are kind of like acting like they have the most fun and are laughing the loudest, really they're just trying to cover up the, the hurt that they're feeling. Um, Actor Shia LaBeouf, LaBeouf, however you pronounce it, uh, before he kind of went off the rails a little bit, back at the very height of his career when he was like the hottest thing, he said this in an interview. Sometimes I feel like I'm living a meaningless life. This is a guy who had it all. He says, I know I'm one of the luckiest dudes in America right now. I have a great house. My parents don't have to work. I've got money. I'm famous. But it could change, man. It, it could go away. You never know. I don't handle fame well. Most actors on most days don't think they're worthy. I have no idea where this insecurity comes from, but it's a God-sized hole. If I knew how, I'd fill it, and I'd be on my way. And Solomon says the same thing. He says, I tried pleasure. I, I tried laughter, but it didn't work. Still empty. So he moves on to trying something else. Uh, verse 3, he says, I tried cheering myself with wine and embracing folly. My mind still guiding me with wisdom. I wanted to see what was good for people to do under the heavens during the few days of their lives. So he's saying, I, I decided to just get hammered, like just to party. And, and probably a lot of us could be like, yeah, I made that same decision at one point in my life. You know, we, we tried to fill that God-shaped hole with partying, and it might have been fun, but at the same time, it never filled that hole. Really, what it did was it just left us more empty. And so what a lot of us did was we partied more and still found ourselves empty. And often, it just ends up leading to addiction, to wrecking my life, to hurting other people. 
Well, Solomon couldn't find pleasure in that, couldn't really find fulfillment in that, so he tried something else. Verse 4, he says, I undertook great projects. I, I built houses for myself and planted vineyards. I made gardens and parks and planted all kinds of fruit trees in them. I, I made reservoirs to water groves of flourishing trees. But basically, he's saying, man, I turned to HG. TV. Like, I, like I, I got the marble countertops, the hardwood floors. I mean, Solomon became obsessed with the comforts of life. For instance, interesting little fact about him. Uh, during his reign as king, he built God a temple, an incredible temple. It took him seven years to have it built. Then he built a palace for himself. It took him 13 years to have it built. Maybe a little indication of his priorities, right? It took him twice as long to build his house as it did to build God's house. And still, he was empty. Possessions, comforts don't fill you up. Verse 7, he says, I bought male and female slaves. And this is a different time. That, that would have been a real sign of wealth. And had other slaves who were born in my house. I also owned more herds and flocks than anyone in Jerusalem before me. I amassed silver and gold for myself and the treasure of kings and provinces. I acquired male and female singers and a harem as well, the delights of a man's heart. And so he's getting more and more stuff, and he's still empty. Deion Sanders uh, was a pro baseball player, pro football player, one of the best football players of his time, a guy who seemingly had it all, like the kind of guy who has the stuff that we're like, man, if I had that kind of money, and he did, he had cars, houses, had everything, and he uh, found that all of it left him nowhere, he was empty, and, and so he ended up later uh, turning to God, becoming a follower of Jesus, put his faith in Jesus, but he talks about uh, that time in his life, he, he says this, everything I touched turned to gold, but inside I was broken and totally defeated. I remember sitting at the back of the practice field one afternoon, away from everybody, and tears were running down my face. I, I was saying to myself, this is so meaningless. I am so unhappy. We're winning every week, and I'm playing great, but I'm not happy. I tried everything, parties, women, buying expensive jewelry and gadgets, and nothing helped. There was no peace. I had everything the world has to offer, but no peace, no joy, just emptiness inside. The Bible describes it in the first chapter of Ecclesiastes as chasing after the wind, and that's exactly what it was like. And some of us know exactly what that's like. Solomon continues in verse 9. He says, I became greater by far than anyone in Jerusalem before me. In all this, my wisdom stayed with me. I, I deny myself nothing my eyes desired. I, I refused my heart no pleasure. My heart took delight in all my labor, and this was the reward for all my toil. Yet when I surveyed all that my hands had done and what I had toiled to achieve, everything was meaningless. A chasing after the wind. Nothing was gained under the sun. Solomon concludes his report on the pursuit of happiness. And he says, man, turned out for me, you don't find happiness that way. Don't let pleasure drive you. All it does is wreck your life. And what you'll discover is that life apart from God, even with all its pleasures, it's meaningless. And my guess is that some of you might be thinking, I hear you, Vince. I, I don't even know if I disagree with what you're saying. It's just not me. Like this just, <laughs> it doesn't apply to me. I mean, I don't have like 700 wives. I, I don't do like 13 years renovations of my house. I don't throw wild parties. I, I don't buy, you know, crazy jewelry. It, it's, it's just not me. Maybe. Maybe not. Maybe not. What I want to do is I want to share with you a couple danger signs. And if they're true of you, then I would say it's a very good indication that you are letting pleasure drive you. That pursuing and trying to achieve pleasure is the driving force of your life. Okay? First warning sign 
is if you often use the phrase or have the thinking, if only, if only, like you think, if only I made a little more money, then I'd be good, then I'd be fine. That's you, you let pleasure drive you. If only I was married, then I'd be happy. If only I was married to someone else, then I'd be happy. If only we had kids. If only our kids would move out of the house. Right? If only I got promoted, I'd be happy. If only I could get a different job, I'd be happy. If only I owned a home instead of living in this little apartment. If only I could sell this home. If only I lost 20 pounds. If only I was better looking. If only I had more friends here. If only I was rich. If only I was famous. If only I got a new car. I would be happy. If you think that way, you're just like Solomon and me, me too. And, and here's the deal. If you get if only, you wouldn't be happy. And you don't have to believe me. You don't even have to believe Solomon who had it all and wasn't happy. Like there's research, lots of research that's been done on this. And so if we want to be geniuses, we can look at the research and say, what does research say? Here's what research tells us. Uh, none of those things bring lasting happiness. So studies show, uh, they have ways of figuring this out, that our circumstances account for about 10% of our level of happiness. Uh, that our circumstances, like getting something or having something different, uh, it has the power to make us happy, but only for a very short while. So you get the promotion, you get the A on your exam, you make the team, you get the new car, yay. But like a gallon of milk, that happiness has a very short shelf life. It's kind of like kids, you know, you, you see a kid uh, on their birthday or Christmas and they unwrap this present and they're like, ah! like this, is the one, this is what I wanted, and they're happy, and next week that, that gift they got is on the closet floor forgotten, and a year later it's in the garage sale, right? It's, it's the same with us, like changing our circumstances, just short little bit of happiness, and it doesn't really change our lives, that's what the research shows. And, and the first sign that you have been letting pleasure drive your life is if you have that thinking, if only. Now, I, I wonder, is that you? What do you think you need to be happy? Whatever it is, it's a sign that you're letting pleasure drive you. And I'll tell you that if you let pleasure drive you, it is not going to take you a place of happiness. Second warning sign is if you think in the, these terms, if you think, when, then I'll be happy. When, fill in the blank. When that happens, then I'm going to be able to really live the life I want to live. When, then I can really live. Uh, when I get my degree and graduate, that's when I'm going to be able to enjoy life. When I finally get this project done that's been overwhelming, then I'll be able to enjoy life. When I finally meet that perfect someone and I have a companion in life, then I'll be able to enjoy life. Do you know what the research shows about this? It's really interesting if you study it. Uh, what it shows is that Unhappy single people, maybe you're unhappy because I'm a single person, become unhappy married people. Happy single people become happy married people. It, it, it's true. Research shows that there is very little difference between people who uh, have a home or don't have a home, people who don't have a job when uh, they do get their job. Those things don't produce happiness. And so maybe we need to realize that happiness needs to come from another place. Happiness is not a when blank happens kind of thing. It's not the degree or the job or the house or the relationship or the new car. People who think that way, they never magically become happy when fill in the blank happens. What the research says is that when that kind of person who has that kind of thinking, when they finally get that and they move on, what they do is they transfer that thinking to another 
when that happens, right? It's like when we, when we have kids and now it's like, oh, when we go on that vacation, there's always something. They, they never lose that kind of thinking. There's a, a psychologist named Dr. Henry Cloud. He wrote a book called The Law of Happiness. He studied happiness, studied all the research that's been on, done on happiness. And I, I think he nails this whole idea of pursuing pleasure. Uh, he writes this, when we are pursuing the things that don't have the power to make us happy, we are ignoring the ones that do. See, that's the problem with this kind of Sheryl Crow adjective. It makes you happy. It might, must not be that bad. Let's go for it. it is, if you're pursuing something that's not going to make you happy, you, you're ignoring something that can. I, I find his conclusion to his research really interesting. He writes this. From all the research that he's done, others have done, he says, here's the conclusion. We'll put it on the screen. Happy people don't chase after happiness. They chase after God and happiness catches them. Happy people don't chase after happiness. They chase after God and happiness catches them. They, they live their lives with this, with this awareness that every moment is a gift from God and he's inviting me to, to share it with him. So, so let me ask you this. And he, he said, if you're pursuing something to make you happy, maybe you're ignoring the thing that could. What might you be ignoring that could maybe bring you some happiness because you're chasing something that can't? Maybe it's your spouse. Maybe you become fixated on what could have been with your high school sweetheart who you've reconnected with on Facebook. And so you're not investing in the marriage that God's given you. Or maybe it's your kids. Maybe you're so focused on making your kid the next Peyton Manning or Bryce Harper that, that you're not enjoying your kids for who they are right now. Or maybe it's your job. You're so focused on all the things that are wrong with your job and complaining about your job that, that you forget to have some gratitude that you have a job. Maybe it's the purpose of life. But what I think happens for a lot of us is we spend so much of our time trying to distract us from life that, that we miss out on the purpose of life. And, and so we're always pursuing, you know, uh, internet sites or we're or, or taking painkillers or we're um, like going after this gambling high or, or we're playing video games or, or involved in sports leagues or becoming a, a scratch golfer is our focus or, or wearing the latest line or, or like checking out what everybody else is doing in social media or magazines. And I, I don't know if any of that's wrong, but the problem is we can often distract ourselves from our own lives and really trying to understand the purpose of our life and start actually living it. Or, what about God himself? What about God himself? Maybe um, for you, maybe God is like a Sunday morning kind of thing. It's like, oh, I'm here. I show up just most every week. I, I give God an hour of my life. Or maybe it's not even been that for you. And, and it, maybe you came here today, a friend invited you, or you saw a billboard or something. And, and maybe God's been this kind of thing, like you kind of put him on the shelf until you need them. You know, it's kind of like the next time I, I have a crisis or something, it's like, oh, where's God? I need, I need to pray about this. I'm in trouble. And, and then you, you pray. And then once you get through that crisis, you kind of put them back on the shelf till the next one. And, and, and you know, the, the, the thing is, it's like, well, I, I don't really have time for God. And the reason is because you're too busy pursuing happiness. But what if happiness is only found in him? The, the research says, Happy people don't chase happiness. They chase after God, and happiness catches them. And it's because deep within our hearts, there is a God-shaped hole, and only God can fit there. I want to um, 
I want to ask you, would you come back for the rest of this series? I realize some of you might be like, I was just going to come this one time to check it out, and that's up to you. But I hope you'll come back for the next four weeks because we're going to learn a lot from uh, Solomon's journal, and I think you're going to find it really helpful. So I I hope if you are new and kind of checking things out, I hope you'll give us a five-week shot, and then you decide. Um, Here's what we're going to do right now, though. I want to give you just a minute or less of silence. And what I want to ask you to do is just to think about what you heard and experienced today And how does it apply to your life? Like our goal here at Verve is not to put on a really cool show or production. Like our goal is to help each other so that we are equipped to to take steps forward in our spiritual journey and get where we need to go. So what step might you need to take based on what you heard today? Okay, so just a little bit of quiet time and then I'll pray to kind of close our our time. And then we just got a couple announcements and we'll get you out of here. God, you are a God of, uh, of amazing grace. And what that means is, um, even if we've already made wrong decisions, even if we've already made a mess of our lives, you still love us. You're still inviting us into relationship, and you still want to rebuild our lives with us and help us to have a second chance. Thank you for loving us that much. God, my prayer is that we wouldn't be like Solomon and wait to the very end to realize, oh man, I should have lived it differently. God, would you help us even today, right now, to decide, I'm not going to waste the one life that I've been given to live. And I'm going to start, instead of chasing after happiness and finding that it's like chasing after the wind and I can never seem to get it, I'm going to start chasing after God. And I, I might not even completely understand what that means right now, but I, I'm going to start pursuing God, and I'm going to believe that if I do, happiness will catch me. Thanks for being a God who wants us. We pray in Jesus' name.